among us, and sometimes they win. Even the devil was an angel once. The world has its own rules, and these rules are not human. Some of us seek answers to the origin and existence of cryptids and the unexplained. Join us as we venture beyond the known and accepted boundaries. Welcome to our nightmare. I think you're going to like it. Folks, good evening and welcome to Fans of Monsters Radio, where we explore the unexplained and live here on Fans of Monsters Radio. Uh, I'm your host, Lon Stricker, coming to you within a cannon shot of historic Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Thanks for joining us. Now, the Fans of Monsters Radio channel was made possible by you liking, subscribing, and sharing our programming. Super chat donations are essential for us to continue offering you our unique content, so your consideration is very much needed and appreciated. Now, tonight, we've got uh, four guests with us uh, on our Cryptid Roundtable. And we're going to occasionally be doing these roundtables with different guests. Uh, so we can kind of get a lot of different perspectives on, in, in our discussion. So first, I've got Josh Wolf Turner, host of Paranormal Roundtable, joining us. He's a proud Texan who grew up around the paranormal and supernatural, having many personal experiences in witnessing otherworldly phenomena. Uh, Josh is a master storyteller who has been collecting paranormal stories as a personal passion since his experience with the upright canine changed his life as a young man, opening his eyes to the paranormal. Paranormal Roundtable has live shows every Tuesday night and new content every Friday night premiering shows on different paranormal topics. Also joining us is Ron Murphy, the crypto guru, who has been investigating the stuff of nightmares for 30 years. Uh, he has delved deeply into the shadows to shed light on things that go bump in the night, meticulously researched the historical and psychological context of myths and legends from around the world. Ron seeks to uncover the monsters that haunt our collective thoughts. Also, we have Kenny W. Irish, otherwise known as a crypto punkologist. He's an author, hardcore punk musician, and sales marketing professional. Originally from the northern parts of Vermont, he has recently relocated to the beautiful Anirondacks area of upstate New York. He has a lifelong love of folklore, legends, monsters, and UFO stories. He has regularly attended and spoke at writers' groups and various other platforms across the country. He has a passion for writing young readers' chapter books. You can also catch him as a co-host on NBA NYBS radio show along with Gary Robusto. And last of all, we have Elijah Henderson. He's the owner of Crypto, Cryptid Studies Institute. He is the host of the YouTube series Nightmare Nuggets of Cryptid Terror and has been engaged in the cryptid field since 2002. When he is not editing or creating the latest Nightmare Nugget, he enjoys active research in the field. Elijah has become a public speaker since he's been 11 years old. So, guys, thanks for coming on this evening. It's a pleasure to be here, my friend. Yes, sir. Thank you for inviting us. Well, thanks for the invite. So we're Lon, Lon, I wanted to say something to you and Kenny before we get started. Sure. You guys have been very gracious in uh, helping in me and supporting me in, uh, with your books and all of your work. And Kenny, thank you for those books. That was really, that was a very uh, nice gesture um, for the children's books. And yeah, uh, I really enjoyed the, you know, your work. So I think Kenny, you're, you're going to be the next big thing, honestly, when, when it comes to being an author, I think your next book is going to be great. And I appreciate uh, uh, everything you've done for our community and Elijah, absolutely a uh, good friend. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to, to, to meet you tonight, Ron. So thanks for the invite guys. Hey, Josh, no problem. I mean, uh, I, Honestly, I, I've never really met Josh before. We've chatted before, and I've had Ron on once or twice. But, uh, you know, Elijah, I've never talked to you. And uh, and Kenny, I've never talked to you either. So I have to thank Vincent for getting everybody together tonight. So thanks again, Vincent. I think, uh, thanks to you guys for joining me this evening. Absolutely. We haven't met in person, Lon, but you are. The ones that I haven't met yet. <laughs> what's that? What's that, Josh? 
I said, we haven't met in person, but you've been on my show and, and yeah. we actually, yeah, you did. We did a three parter together actually back when my old co-host was still, was still alive before he lost his life to COVID. But, mm. um, you, you were on my show and, and we've spoken on the phone multiple times, but never, yeah. never, you know, I've never been on your show. So, well, it's a first time for everything. So we got you here tonight. <laughs> yeah. So cryptids. We're going to talk about cryptids. And, you know, I want you guys to be open as much as possible. You know, I like to get all kinds of ideas, theories on what we think about cryptids. And that, that comes into the first question. What are your theories on, on cryptids? Are they real? Are they, extra, ex, you know, interdimensional? Are they some type of manifestation that comes in and out? What, what are your thoughts on that, Josh? I'm going to let you go first. Uh, yeah, my, I, I guess my, <laughs> well, Lon, we've talked about this. Um, you know, I have my own opinions about each one. I think that there, I have mm -hmm. colleagues that believe that, that Sasquatch is a flesh and blood creature. And I have colleagues that think it's completely interdimensional and uh, I'm somewhere in the middle. I think that it's both. And, uh, mm -hmm. I've even, you know, talked with Barton at length and Elijah, you've been part of that too, where we think maybe they could come from the inner earth. Um, also the, the, the theory of them being Nephilim, uh, the bloodline of the fallen. Um, that's a very popular theory, which I think is a very plausible theory. Uh, when it comes to dog, man, like Lon, you've, you've told me before that you, you know, you've gotten reports of these things having like a silver glow to them. I've heard reports of green glow. Um, you know, and, and of course Sasquatch, you know, there, there's reports of them looking absolutely flesh and blood and then just disappearing. Mm -hmm. um like phantoms you know i think that the phantoms and monsters i think that's a pretty good name it kind of sums <laughs> it up you know, what are we dealing with here um people argue back and forth all day but i think that the, the silly the silliest idea is that they're all just some sort of undiscovered species because i don't believe that's true um it, it's hard to believe that when you know you know in, in a way now i'm just going to interject here before it goes somebody else but you know <clears throat> The lack of bodies, the lack of real physical evidence for the most part, um, it, it just makes it hard to believe that these beings are out there all the time. You know, I, I get it where people believe, like a lot of other indigenous species, that they're not seen a lot. But we do find remains of these other beings and, uh, and these other indigenous animals. But cryptids, for the most part, we just don't have that. We just have not found anything. Uh, so, Ron, what's your what's your thoughts on the theory of, these, of the cryptids? Well, I think the idea of cryptids is uh, is fairly loaded because there's a lot of people out there that call themselves cryptozoologists, mm -hmm. and they're not looking for Bigfoot or dogmen. You know, they're looking for things like the thylacine or the ivory billed woodpecker. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the way we can you know have to look at this. A lot of people come from this from a very naturalistic point of view, from a biological point of view. And if things do not make sense, they simply throw it out. Um, I, you have to look at this very broad-minded, don't you? Because I have interviewed plenty of people who have seen Bigfoot and you know, describe some sort of cloaking type of uh, a manifestation to the creature or it looked like it was pixelating itself. Um, also, some of my anecdotal encounters that I've had, even though I've never seen anything, I've had things happen to me and I've seen foot footways, you know, track trackways uh, just starting out of nowhere and disappearing into nothing as well, too. So I think that when we talk about this, I think that whenever we talk about phantom, phantoms and monsters, that makes the most sense. Um, people are seeing something out there. There is something that comes into this world and is tangible enough to leave tracks or to leave behind hair or to leave behind a scratch mark or something like that. But again, from all of my research, there is no way they could be here all the time, uh, especially whenever we talk about Bigfoot and the Dogman, two apex predators overlapping a very limited area. You know, people will be stumbling upon these things all the time. If they were indeed a part of our world, they have to eat, they have to make babies, they have to be territorial. All this kind of stuff goes into the idea of, of a cryptid, you know. Now, if they're self-aware, 
that's one thing, you know, being self-aware, knowing that they have to be staying hidden uh, for their own livelihood. Uh, that's a very important thing because intelligence comes into it. Uh, but I think that we're dealing with something that here that cannot be explained totally by science. I think that what we're dealing with here is something outside of our known physics at, at this moment, at least. Mm -hmm. well, what are your thoughts, Kenny? Well, I always start out by saying it really depends on what day it is. There's, I mean, I've had <laughs> periods where I'm just like, okay, we're talking flesh and blood and then periods where we're talking extraterrestrials. So, and you know, I, I, I really ag uh, agree with what um, uh, Josh and Ron have said so far um, that there's, there's gotta be more to it, uh, especially as we continue to, let's say, knock down forests and build, you know, highways and, and different things like that. I mean, it's, it's, you would think that you would be seeing a lot more, but we are, but we aren't. And so I, I don't know, you know, um, I, I definitely, you know, I've talked to some uh, credible people that have said to me that, you know, they've seen something right in front of them that appeared to be some type of Sasquatch, some type of dog man being, and then it just kind of like crumble and disappear in front of them. Um, so it, it, it really, again, it really comes down to, you know, what I'm studying at the time or what I'm looking into at that point in time. But I, at one point in time, when it came to Sasquatch, I was 100% flesh and blood and mm. I'm, I'm like 50% now. Um, <laughs> it just, the more people I talk to the, the, the more things that, that I come across and, um, it, it just really kind of, I, I don't know. Plus I, I also think to, you know, to be somebody that studies the subject or or looks into it um if you kind of draw that line in the sand and say this is what i believe i think you're going to miss out on a lot and i think you're going to miss out on learning a lot too as well yeah if i could piggyback on that real quick i know that we haven't been to everybody but that's absolutely the case um i think that whenever we're in this field you have to keep your eyes open and your mind completely open. It's okay to be skeptical. We have to be skeptical about things, yeah. but there are a lot of researchers out there that believe that this is a flesh and blood animal and anything that they get as a report that is outside of that idea that they've already um, projected onto this, this animal, they throw it away. So we're losing a lot of, of, of evidence. We're losing a lot of research because if you stand so if you if you if you dig your feet into the ground and you only think that it's one thing we're losing out on all this research that's being thrown away whenever somebody tells them something that's different than what they believe okay how about you elijah what are your thoughts well brother in, in my case i kind of i stand with uh largely what josh said kind of kind of in the middle of i've always been of the persuasion that bigfoot was a flesh and blood creature you know I've got hair samples here that was gathered by researcher Mary Green. I'm sure you all know who she is. Mm -hmm. And uh, they came back from the laboratory as undocumented primate. So I, I do believe there's a physical aspect there. But I'm also a hardcore Seventh-day Adventist Christian. I believe that, you know, fallen angels do their own work too. I believe they deceive many of people. And that would account for your dogman sightings and Bigfoot sightings that just appear and disappear. Mm -hmm. Your dogman sightings where it gives people malicious evil grins and just seems to enjoy terrorizing people but i also believe that there is a a certain number of so, something physical out there as well you know uh in the case of dogman you know uh and land between the lakes miss linda godfrey wrote about a story where a gentleman seen a dogman mother going across the road with a couple of pups which would seem to imply something of a physical nature which you know could reproduce and, you know, in the case of Big Feet, you know, you find scat in the woods, you find prints, uh, evidence that it tampered with the terrain. You find where it tore open, you know, fallen down trees and dug out a worm, which I don't think of a, anything of a spiritual nature is probably going to do. So I, I genuinely think it's a kind of a mix of things you got going mm. on there. You know, real, real quick, I, I just wanted to um, respond to something Elijah just said. Um, and and that's what I kind of mean when I say that, you know, I kind of go back and forth. Like for instance, when individuals talk about um, these beings being extraterrestrial, I see extraterrestrial as flesh and blood mm -hmm. um, where, uh, you know, some, some people may not, but um, you know, anytime we talk about anything that's extraterrestrial, it's never really in a spirit realm. Um, it's always been kind of physical. Like, you know, people talk about the grays and, and different types of um 
you know, uh, extraterrestrial life form. I've always seen that as flesh and blood. So um, if something is based and, and that's the thing, I mean, a lot of the time when we think of something that's coming out of the sky, we think of the ET, you know, we think we think of, you know, the, the these thin bodies with these these awkward shaped heads. Uh, but then when you watch Star Wars, you know, movies that have to do with like, you know, out of out of out of space and, and out of the uh, um, the earth. I mean, you've got Chewbacca, you've got all these different creatures with all these different looks. So, um, and, you know, and, and again, to touch on what Elijah said too, um, I, I'm a Christian as well. And I believe that there's a evil side and then there's, 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 there's angels. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I've had people actually tell me that when the Mothman gets brought up that they believe it's, it was actually a, a possessed man or an actual demon. So um, it's just, I mean, you can go around and round and round with all these, uh, different, uh, um, subjects and theories, but that's actually what keeps me coming back to it is just the, the unknown and the, the vast, um, the unexplained that, that goes along with it. Well, I, I personally believe for the most part, and, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I had encounters and, uh, you know, when you see something standing in front of you, first thing you think is, well, this thing is real. It's flesh and blood. And maybe what I saw was indigenous. Maybe it was something, you know, that is out there in, in flesh and blood, but lives on the earth plane. And I think in, in the case of Bigfoot, that there's some areas where these, these things are indigenous. I'm talking about the Pacific Northwest, Florida, around the, the Gulf Coast. I think I think that may very well be true. But I also believe that for the most part, the cryptids that we see are ultra terrestrials. And when I say ultra terrestrials, I believe they have the ability to come in and out from another linear dimension, mm -hmm. but are flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. uh, they appear for a fleeting moment for the most part, and that they are, um, but they are flesh and blood. They have the ability to do that somehow. Now, that's just my theory. And, you know, I my, that theory has kind of been bolstered a bit by some of these encounters and these cases we've had in Chicago with these winged humanoids. And uh, I, I'm starting to believe that a lot of what we're discovering may very well apply to a lot of the cryptids that we encounter, that people report. I, have, I, have, I wanted to say something. I saw Ken Gerhard there. I say, hey, Ken, yeah. how you doing? He's a colleague of ours. But uh, Ken, Ken is a big. <laughs> he put on their aper for life. Okay, Ken is in the field is what we're, what is known as an aper. Like he explained that to, on my show one night. What what he believes is that they're solid flesh and blood. That that's the real thing. But he he made a post one day on Facebook, and you know, and Facebook is just powder keg stuff, you know, whatever. But he, he made a post saying that Dogman is not a cryptid. That he doesn't believe it's a cryptid. And mm -hmm. then everything just exploded, you know, boom, 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 you know. Well, I tend to agree with that. And I, I caught some heat for that because I was asked by multiple people if I thought it was a cryptid. And I said, no, I don't think it is. To me, a cryptid is like, you know, like what you were saying, Ron, like a giant squid or an undiscovered prehistoric kangaroo, which I had a dingo wrangler from Australia actually tell me that. Because one of my cousins used to live there, and that's what he did. They actually had bounties on dingoes at one time. And they saw these kangaroo that were just ginormous, like kangaroo. Like, it, it, it was unreal. Of course, it was back in, like, the early 90s or whatever, and they weren't just walking around with cell phones. Um, but he said that they looked prehistoric. And then I, I talked to a, a guy that was a researcher down there. Um, and then I talked to the late Scott Martis, and we all kind of came to the conclusion that they do exist. They're there. We just, you know, it's like you were saying about the thylacine. And you get giant turtles. There's theories that there was this great white shark that was bitten in the Marianas Trench, that it was a giant turtle. Um, those are what I would consider like what Ken was looking for with the salamander, um, the expedition he did, you know, to look for the Thunderbird. Th those are cryptids in, in, in the very truest sense. And that's what Ken was saying, that Dogman uh -huh. is not really a cryptid. That it, and Lon, we've talked about this. You, you said it on my show. I mean, it, it, we, we get these... Uh, reports of these things glowing and looking like uh, they got some kind of you know weird you know aura about them or or you'll see them coming out of balls of light i've had people on my show talking about them jumping out of balls of light that's not uncommon 
you but you but then by the same token you get people that, that claim that they see bigfoot doing that too now i'm not saying that big bigfoot just sounds more plausible as a possible giant ape like maybe that's part of what's going on mm -hmm. or maybe a throwback prehistoric human like what you saw one um you know but i think that there is another side to that too and it, because you do hear of these hairy upright creatures coming out of balls of light but then it gets kind of it gets more you know muddled when i was doing research near Giddings, texas with these ranchers and they were giving us reports of Sasquatch, Sasquatch, Sasquatch. When two of this one rancher's nephews were were riding the fence line on their ATVs, they clearly saw this Sasquatch. When it turned to the side, it had a muzzle. Mm -hmm. Like it had a muzzle. It wasn't a snout per se, but it was a muzzle, um, which people are calling the Gugwe, which has straight legs like the Bigfoot, has the Bigfoot style feet. But then it has that weird looking muzzle. Like, what is that? I mean, like, is that like a cross between a dog man and a Bigfoot? You know, is that even possible? Like, what could that, you know, I mean, that's just a weird thing. And so when I when I questioned, I didn't talk to both of them, but when I talked to one of the the nephews, he said, yeah, when it turned to the side, the profile of it, um, you could clearly see, I mean, there, there was brush there, but it walked out from outside the brush for briefly and they could see a, a muzzle, um, you know, and so... I don't know if you guys are familiar with the term Gugwe, uh, you know, but that's just, that's what they're calling this like in betweener type creature, um, you know, and so you can't really explain that away. And how would people that are absolutely uh, flesh and blood explain something like that? Like, how do you explain that, that it has the, the body of a Bigfoot, but it has this uh, face that looks like a, you know, I mean, I don't know, like a, like a canid type face, but it, but it's a short muzzle, you know? And then you get reports uh, of these these thin uh, dogman type creatures. I got some from, from all the way from Mississippi, Louisiana, Tennessee. Um, th actually, some up there where Elijah's from. Mm -hmm. And they look thin, kind of emaciated. They have like a V-shaped body. They have like really skinny arms and legs. You know, and you're thinking devil monkey because, you know, that's another it's a funny term. But, you're, you know, the rebobs mm -hmm. in, in California in the Napa Valley. Um, you know, you get stories out of there, you know, they say, you know, that they're real, that there's people that talk about them all the time, but I, I don't know. I don't know what to make of it because if you just said, okay, these things are all flesh and blood undiscovered creatures, then you have to say that every single one of these types is an, is a, is an undiscovered creature. And when you, when you get multiple accounts, you know, especially when they're in clusters and areas, you know, there's a little flap here, a little flap there you know, then it, it, it lends credence to it. One of the things that I've been researching in another area is Caldwell, Texas. And I had a, a, um, a few people that I've uh, in, talked to about their encounter that this dog man type creature is actually transparent. When they shine a light, it, go, it goes right through it. I'm going to have this lady, hopefully she'll come on my show on Tuesday and tell her encounter that she drove through this thing. Um, but, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, there was clear a clear flap that went on uh with these ranchers out there saying that they were seeing a dogman type creature one guy had a, a a steer's head that was torn right off and that was thrown onto his on his doorstep um that wouldn't that would indicate a, a flesh and blood creature but you know elijah we've talked about this at length you know me and you um just because something can manifest as physical doesn't mean that that's what its actual form is Mm. Uh, the, the demonic can actually manifest right. itself as physical and manipulate things completely manipulate things so i mean you know and, and not understanding oh, well, that oh, sure. is a big problem mm. uh, but then so can infrasound infrasound can also um influence the way somebody perceives their environment as well too and we're dealing with something biological at that point you know we know that you know, cetaceans produce infrasound. We also know uh, elephants produce it as well as tigers. This feeling of dread that can come over a person. And one of my theories is that these creatures that we're dealing with here, um, getting back to the idea of ultra-terrestrials, that um, it it may be indeed that we're dealing with an intelligence within the environment that is projecting itself onto our um, onto our subconscious. And we are filling in the blanks and we're seeing something out there um, because we're kind of predisposed to it. And this is the reason why we have such lack of video and uh, photographic evidence. 
Uh, I just want to mention peace. Thanks for your donation. Very much appreciated. Uh, you guys, uh, any more thoughts on this? Uh... I don't know. I, I, I tend to believe that, that, you know, like you said, Lon, I mean, we need, we need more proof. I mean, of these things, yeah. there are people who absolutely believe that we're going to find this, this undiscovered species called dog, man. <laughs> And I just yeah. don't believe that. I just do not believe that because it would have already happened. I, I believe so, too. I mean, well, you know, you, you go back and look at some of the historical sightings of some of these things. Yeah. And uh, I, I just talk about in Pennsylvania. Uh, when Butch and I were started looking into the, the Pennsylvania upright canines and the dog man or whatever you want, you want to call each one of these. And there are different types that people have reported. We, we've got several reports that go back into the 1800s. I mean, these things have been reported for a long time. And I know in other areas they have as well. But, uh, you know, it, why does it seem like, and that, is it because of the Internet? Is it because of communications and such? Why do the theories now, as far as Big, Bigfoot and, and, and Dogman and these other beings, tend to be more supernatural as opposed to being a flesh and blood. Is, is it just something that's getting mixed in or more people thinking about it or, or what? What do you think on that? Tulpas? Well, that, that, that might be a tulpa or thought form. Is that what it could be? You know, when I wrote my first book, I brought up a lot of that about, you know, and I know, uh, I know Nick Redfern and other people have talked about, uh, people who have seen these uh these beings just suddenly appear in front of them uh like a relic from another time that just you know suddenly manifest uh could it be tulpas could it be a thought form and of course one of the things that i like to talk about all the time as well too is the idea of elementals you know it's hard to use the word fairy anymore because people will laugh at you uh, but the idea of the fey realm or the fairy realm uh somehow uh you know still being existent in the in the in, in our modern world i think there's something to be said about that uh because if you look at the antiquity uh encounters of fairies we talked about there's things talked about as like glamour the idea that these things were able to change shapes you know we call Oh, shape shifting now of course uh but the idea that they are able to appear uh, differently than what they uh actually are mm -hmm. i think a lot of that goes into play as well too but there's not a lot of people forming um panels talking about fairies anymore like i said but i think it's something interesting be, to at least be considered well you know the the fairy realm is being talked more and more in, among people who look into cryptids i mean it, mm -hmm. another phenomenon it, it used to be a time when you just had a certain section of people that were talking mm -hmm. about it, but it's coming into it's coming into the, the crypto world more and more. I read more and more about this. People are presenting these cases mm -hmm. and more people are, are actually coming forward and reporting these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And if you look at, you know, European encounters with uh, with what we would call, you know, a Bigfoot type creatures uh, in, in Scotland and, and Ben McDewey, you know, that you have the gray man, mm -hmm. uh, which sometimes assumes the, the form of a, a gray mist. Sometimes it's seen as a, a 12 foot tall lumbering bipedal creature. Uh, and especially the uh, Native Americans of the Pacific Northwest, they've always seen the idea of the Bigfoot or the Sasquatch to be able to straddle two different worlds at once. What we kind of already been talking about the idea that it can be a physical form in this world, but its origins is from a different place altogether. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think what you said, Ron, about the, the, the fair, the Fae, mm -hmm. um, they have their own society too. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, it's very elaborate. You know, you have the Sealy court, the mm -hmm. unseely court, you know, you have like the, the aristocratic, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and and they have their own origin stories and they mm -hmm. have their own, you know, you're not supposed to take any gifts from them. Don't smoke tobacco with right. them. Don't, right. don't, you know, because they'll trick you. Um, I told a story on my show where a guy was gone for two for a year. He was missing for a year of 2017 and he showed up and it was like all he did was talk to two little diminutive guys and he smoked tobacco with them and yeah. ate a piece of bread and went to sleep. That was it. Boom. <laughs> I mean, some people will laugh and be like, oh, he was dropping acid or something, you know, but that's not what happened. The guy told me, he's like, dude, I didn't do anything. I just, you know, this is all I did. I was fighting with my wife. She thought I ran out on her, you know, and so he told me this crazy story. 
Um, but I, I, I wanted to say what, what you're talking about, Ron, it makes a lot of sense because if you go to the Arabian, you know, go, go to the Middle East, mm-hmm. the Arabian stories stretching back as far as we can remember to Zoroastrianism before Islam, before mm-hmm. the Moors, you know, um, you had the stories of the jinn. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Know they come up a lot. And, and But I think that each region has their own type of fairy, jinn, whatever. Um, in North America, we have the Pugwudgies. We have these little mischievous people, the Duende in Spanish. Then here, they call them the Duende. And then you have, the, or, or they, they call them uh, uh, monitos, you know. So you got all these weird little types of creatures, you know. But then over there, you have leprechauns and you have elves and then you have goblins, you know. And, and then, you know, I know up there in Kentucky in the caves, they talk about the goblins. And then, of course, in the deserts, you have the Jinn. And then wow. in the British Isles, you have the Fey. I think that each one of them has their own region. Mm-hmm. And I think that it's their their area that they control. Just like humans, we have our own countries, you know, and, and you know, I think that they, because in the Quran, it talks about this. I'm not Islamic, but I do study different religions. And one of the things I remember reading, and I know that the Hadith is, an, is an, also a very esoteric book, much like the, the Kabbalah is to the Jewish community. The, the Hadith is kind of the esoteric to the Islamic community. But it talks about the jinn as, as living, you know, in the green mountains, in the calf, you know, and it says that they have neighbors. It doesn't really elaborate on what their neighbors are. We know that they live a right angle from a right angle from us, which is basically the fourth dimension, like you were saying, Lon. And I think that these things can come in and out of the fourth dimension into the third dimension and influence us. Just as we could, you know, if you drew a, 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 on a piece of paper, like a little stick figure, that guy's world is two dimensional completely. And we're in the third dimension. We can see it and he can't hide or do anything that we can't see just as we can't hide or do anything from the, the, the hidden ones, the, the, the fourth dimensional beings, we can't hide from them. They can see everything we're doing because they're from the fourth dimension. It's a fourth density as, as a lot of people would call it. Mm-hmm. And I think that, that a lot of these creatures, I think that's where they come from. And, and I think that I'll take it a step further. I think that, that, that it could come from the inner earth, but it could be another dimensional inner earth, if that makes right. any sense. And like you said, Lon, ultra terrestrial, I think that's very, very uh, possible. I, I, I look at Admiral Byrd's work, you know, when he, mm. you know, flew into the center of the earth and he saw this whole world down there, you know. But he, yeah. Yeah, from a sociological perspective, I like to look at the uh, the, uh, the 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 right the well the, the beliefs of the uh, indigenous peoples of uh, Australia. You know, Australia is set apart by itself out there, but you know their civilization is one of the oldest on Earth, um, and they have the idea of the of the dream time, this other world, the dream time, yeah, yeah where they where, where people can sort of. Um, transcend into it, you know, this sort of existentialist type of uh, experience. But the creatures that inhabit that world can often interact with with ours as well, too. And one of those creatures is called the Wangina. And if you would look at it the way it's, uh, 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 you know, put on cave art, the way it's illustrated in cave art, uh, it looks remarkably like what we would call, um, you know, a gray, some sort of alien type of creature. And then the other creature they had is called the Mimas, uh, which is a very thin uh, creature um, that acts almost like uh, the European fairy wood. And uh, they are said to inhabit the space between spaces. So again, we're talking about this other world. We're talking about this place where um, two realities sort of intersect, but these creatures are residing in a world um, all to their own. Yeah. I think that uh, the the whole the dream time thing. I think that that actually is just basically them remembering from their, their ancestral past. Mm. Um, and the aboriginals were there for a long, long time and isolated from other humans, right. but yet they still have very similar stories. Like there's a giant lizard that they believed existed. You know, of course people say they still see it to this day. It's the size of a Volkswagen. Mm. Um, I don't know if those stories are, are to be believed, but uh, I haven't personally had somebody come and tell me any, any of them from Australia, but I have heard of it in Rio Doso um, in New Mexico. I had a story that, that was given to me and I followed up the leads, um, you know, and I was at the end of the mountain gods and I just started talking to the, the, the people there, you know, and they told me some pretty fascinating stories. Like you said, the indigenous people, they tend to know, 
And uh, the the Mescalero Apache are very convinced that there is a giant lizard that lives up in that area. They also talked of like a giant bear-like creature that, that, that stalks the mountain and that it hunts up there and that every now and then people will just go missing. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a, it's a camp, uh, campground up on the mountain, you know, and I actually was, I actually went on to the reservation when I was there because I was invited. I wasn't, you know, but you're not allowed, if you're not invited, you're not allowed to go to the reservation. Um, but yeah, I, I've been on a couple different reservations and I've had conversations with people who, um, they, their, their world that they live in <clears throat> is very more, it's, it's much more open than the Western minded world. You know, also my godson is Vietnamese. He's my part-time co-host and, and, you know, talking with his family to them, their ancestors and everything that they, they talk to them. Like we talk to each other. Like I could pick up the phone and call you, Kenny. They can literally go into sleep and like talk to their ancestors. It's just like a very normal thing to them. But I think here in the West, we're very closed off to the idea that we think, Oh, we're so modern. That's crazy that these people have these, traditions and beliefs and that there that there's something wrong with them because they they oh they're pre, they, you know, they're, they're they're living in this prehistoric time or whatever and we're so modern but reality it's kind of flipped really to me i think we've gotten away from what's what's real which is actually the spirit and i think that because we're actually i think we're spirits having a physical experience not the other way around and we lose sight of that that this is just a vessel that god gave us to 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 house the spirit um, to me, there's a soul and it's about that big. It's a ball of light. And that's who we really are. You know, to, to uh, you know, kind of piggyback off of that, I've been doing a lot of um, international uh, research and a lot of what I've been coming across um, are seen as spirits. So it, it, it kind of goes right along with what you're saying. Um, I've mostly for my whole life just, you know, studied different types of um, unexplained in the United States and uh I'd say like in the last year, I've, I've really looked into other countries and um, the majority of what I'm coming across seems to be some type of spirit. I mean, you still come across the stories of these different types of, um, you know, creatures which are believed to be flesh and blood. But the majority of them, they somehow end up the more you look into it, they end up going into like a like more of a spirit type of um uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, just, just, just a, a more spirit type of um, uh, description compared to um, what I I would think. You know, if I if I'm looking into this this certain country and I'm looking into this certain legend, um, shortly after going into it, all of a sudden it's talking about it being a spirit. It's an angry spirit. It's a happy spirit. It's a spirit that that can be happy, can be angry. Um, so again, you know, like you said, Josh, you know, we're talking, you know, like in, in, in the U S you know, it's, you know, we're less talking spiritual, um, uh, but you, you look into these other countries like Malaysia and, and all these other places, everything is spirit. Everything is wrapped around some spirit has some type of spirit entity attached to it. Yeah. So uh, let's get into personal encounters. Uh, I'm kind of interested to find out if either Either you gentlemen have had a personal encounter with a cryptid or an unexplained being at some point. Uh, let's start off with uh, let's start off with uh, Elijah. Can you tell us of anything? That's something I can tell you about that this would have personally happened to me. I, I don't generally talk about it because it is kind of unusual in nature, and I've never really known what to think about it. Uh. My family back in around 2000, 2000, 2000, 2003, we had something real big and deep out at us at a place called Brook Springs, Tennessee. And it's so loud, it would literally vibrate your chest. You could literally feel it shaking in your chest. And it, it was just terrifying. I was about five or six at the time. So the, the stuff to Bigfoot, you know, just really terrified me at the time. Uh, um, Wow. Elijah, you're uh, really so breaking up. Yeah, wood. you're really breaking up, my friend. We, we he seems to be straddling two Am worlds at once. Breaking up pretty bad. <laughs> straddling two worlds. I had to uh, switch to my phone when it was going so badly. Yeah, well, yeah, it sounds good uh, now. Go ahead and continue. Uh, anyway, uh, 
here in Clarksville, Tennessee, I live down in the woods, uh, surrounded by woods and ditches. And on one occasion, I was playing outside with my sister. She was climbing a tree, and I was, you know, watching her climb this tree. And I look across one of our ditches off in the woods, and I see it what looks exactly like a Sasquatch walking through the woods. And But the strange exception to it was that it had a tail on it. It came down kind of in a U-shape. And the end of it was kind of jiggling and bobbing around like that. It, it looked like Sasquatch, but it just had that, that big, big terrified of Bigfoot. I ran inside, leaving my sister to fend for herself in the tree, so to speak. And I went and grabbed my mom, got her outside, and it was all gone. Sister's out of the tree. She's fine. And, you know, I'm freaking out. Mom, I, I just seen a big And uh, my sister says, no, it wasn't a Bigfoot at all. You seen a hunter. Uh, she'll swear to this day she's seen a hunter walking through the woods, and that tail was a gun hanging on its back. I know exactly what I've seen. I mean, you, you can't mistake a big monkey man with a tail walking through the woods. But to add to the interest of that, we live down the street in some witches, and uh, they celebrate Beltane, the highest day on the occult calendar. They got all this, the symbols on their, their car, their bumper stickers and whatnot. Uh, they celebrate some intense things. One day we were at the gas station fueling up and my sister sees that hunter at that gas station and he's climbing into that car that's always coming out of the, uh, the driveway going off into the woods where those witches live. So whoever that gentleman was that she's seen was the witches that lived down the road. To this day, I maintain I seen what looked like a Bigfoot. She maintains she's seen what looked like a hunter. I don't know. <laughs> well, that's interesting. <laughs> I don't know how to explain that. Never really but... knew how to classify it. Yeah. Oh. How about Elijah, you, when you, I wanted to say something to Elijah. Okay. Um, the late Johnny Henderson, your your father, great man, good good friend of mine. We, you guys were working on a project. Now this is a little more you know, paranormal, not so much encrypted, but I mean, you guys were working on a project. Okay. And I'm not, I'm not saying this is what happened, but, uh, we started to do a lot of research together, me and your dad. And then of course, Barton Nunley and you, and we started talking about the bell, Witch, and which you subsequently finished the project, right? Well, I've got one more part to do, uh, to just kind of get it finished up. Don't know when I'm going to get to it, but, uh, there, there's kind of an urban legend that when you work on anything involving the Bell Witch, that you're mm -hmm. bound to have bad luck. I talked to a fellow who uh, he helped with a documentary around early 2000s, and once they got it all filmed and finished up, the studio where the footage was being held caught on fire, and they were able to save the footage and everything, but the mm -hmm. area around caught on fire. Since we've been started working on this documentary series for the Bell Witch, we've had... Uh, Three cars blow up. Uh, all four of my family members, me, my sister, mom, and dad, had to go to the emergency room. My mom was diagnosed with cancer, and she passed away. My dad mm -hmm. got COVID, and he passed away. I almost lost my eye. Um, I had to go into the hospital because of a really bad allergic reaction. My sister sliced open her finger. Uh, something sat down in the bed with my mother while she was trying to sleep. Something sat down in the bed with my dad when he was in bed. And we have all these, uh, my mother loved Christmas. So outside on our porches, you know, we'd have those wire lights, you know, kind of deck it out, make it look like Christmas and whatnot. We'd always come home and find those lights turned on. And I, I live down in the woods, kind of away from people. So there's no reason why these should be on. The remotes on are kind of tucked away and hidden where you couldn't really see them. But these lights would be on. So we come home one time. And there's seven strands of these lights on at one time. And, you know, we, we, you know, think it's weird. We turn them off. But I put out a trail camera to see if, you know, maybe we can catch somebody coming down here. Maybe it's a curious Bigfoot turning stuff on. I don't know. Uh, we go inside for about an hour. Come outside. And uh, another strand of those lights is on just outside view of the trail cam. So it didn't pick anything up. But it, it's been nothing but a constant tragedy since working on that thing. 
Mm. Yeah, and your and your dad and me had talked. He 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 contracted COVID same time I did, and he passed away. Yeah, I survived. My wife time. survived. We all got sick at the same time, and so did Armando, my former co-host. And um, Armando, he passed away too. I think you and I think your your dad and him passed away like within four days of each other. And it was a, mm. it was a really my rough, neighbor passed rough away about that time too. Yeah, it was really rough. And, and I know that that I had somebody when I it was Jason Bland from Paranormal Soup, who's been on my show, and 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 he me and him were talking, and he says you're working on that Bellwitch, you know, project. Are you gonna? Because I was gonna bring you on Elijah, and we were gonna do it. And I, and I told Jason Bland about it in passing, and he goes, dude, <laughs> there's a serious curse attached to that thing. Um, well, a couple of days after I talked to your dad, who he started to be of the of the mind that something was going on. Um, and I know that when he was in the hospital, he would talk about, you know, something being by his bedside, which was unnerving, you know, and, and I remember getting out of the shower one day and I was in a hurry. I was running around doing whatever. And I, this is weird. I thought it was my wife right there in the bathroom. I thought that she had come in the bathroom. And so I was like reaching for a towel and I said, honey, can you, and I look and I, I, for a split second, I saw a woman, but it was tall and, and like weird looking. And I, and I thought, whoa, and I, and I kind of fell back and I almost slipped in the tub and it just kind of was like, it, it shocked me. My immediate thought was this is, has something to do with what's, what we're talking about. And and I thought at that point I need to stop talking about it because people in my household began to see this black thing moving around, um, which wasn't there previously. And so, yeah, I, I, I talked to uh, a few of my friends, including Barton, you know, and, and actually Ken too. I think me and Ken even talked about that and everybody was like, look, dude, that's not a very good subject. And, so kudos to you if you finish the project, Elijah, but I, I would, I'm not going to be, <laughs> I'm kind of like done with that, but you know, what's <laughs> I don't know when I'm going to get to it anyway. Well, maybe never, I, maybe I, you I, should just let it go, <laughs> you know, but uh, here's the funny thing. I don't Jason know, was on my I don't know if you me. ever heard about it. What is it? Anyway, J Jason was on my show, oh, and, and I don't, one of the things he I don't know if you out, ever heard, but uh... I think there's kind of a delay there. You're, you're uh, on your on your feed there, Elijah. Um, the whole thing with the I, bell, the the I bell witch so. started with a, a creature. It started with some sort of like hairy creature that John Bell witnessed in in the in a field, and Jason Bland was very very uh, he, he adamant that that was. He thinks there was something to that, um, just like the whole Skinwalker Ranch thing, you know, like this this creature, this giant wolf. When when they first started, all the stuff kicked off. Uh, they shot it and flesh flew off of it, but nothing happened, um, you know. And then all this wackiness ensues, um, and that sometimes that seems to be the case. Like it's like these uh, dogmen or Bigfoot or or whatever these these furry creatures show up, and then all kinds of stuff starts happening. People seeing UFOs. Um, you know, people's appliances going off in their house. Uh, it's just, I, I, I don't think that's a coincidence. A lot of people will sit there and compartmentalize. There's one talk show host that does it all the time. He, he just takes that one subject and, and sucks it away from the rest of it. And, you know, and it looks like a really cool story, but you're, you're, you're left wanting because there's all this other stuff that went on that you're not hearing about. You're only hearing about that part of it, you know? Um, and I don't, and I think it's a, it's a part, it's a nugget of a bigger hole. It's not just one little thing. Um, cause you can take one Bigfoot encounter and just tell that. And it just sounds like, oh yeah, that's what it is. It's just that, but you're not talking about any of the other stuff, you know? And I think that the problem is in our field, guys like you, Kenny, Elijah, uh, Ron, Lon, you guys are, you know, we're birds of a feather. Because we're looking at this thing from the mosaic that it is, this this big picture. You're, you're sitting back looking at this. We're not like right up against it going, okay, this is my subject here. And this is all I'm going to talk about because everything else is just horseradish, you know. You can't do that. I just really feel like that, 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 that we have to, to come together. It, it, but you can't. It's so hard when you talk to the UFO community. They want nothing to do with Bigfoot. When you talk to the Bigfoot community, they want nothing to do with ghosts. Ghost people don't want anything to do with dog man. Dog man doesn't want anything to do with UFOs. It just goes round and round in a big circle. 
but they're all interconnected. And, and I'm telling you this, this is the absolute truth. I really believe this. I think that it's all related. I think what Kenny said was very important because, and you guys have all made some very good points. Kenny, you said you talk to people and it always, they always revolve around a spirit. And I think that that is a very, very important piece of that puzzle. And Ron, what you said about the Fae, I think that lays it out there. I think you just got like, you know, and then of course, Lon, your whole body of work revolves around, you know, it all being interconnected. And and we've talked about that multiple times. Elijah, you too. Um, I think that we're all on the same page, you know, but I think if more people would have discussions like this and get the people involved and, and, and talk about these things and bring it all together, I think that we could make some headway in actually getting toward, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know, get to the bottom of some of these cases, you know, because like when you go to someone's house, they're scared to tell you, well, you know, my blender came on the washing machine and dryer were bouncing around. My, my child is seeing this wolf like creature talking to it in the window. And there's a shadow man running around the hallway. Um, and that actually was a case that we investigated me and my team, the PRT people. And we, the, the husband, of course, he was like, I didn't see nothing. I saw some shadows and a wolf. Well, okay. Well, you did see something then, you know, but he didn't want, he didn't want to admit that he had witnessed it. It was all just, he was trying to block it out of his mind. Um, his wife, meanwhile, and the children are terrified They're And, and, and of course she doesn't want me to think she's crazy. So she told me a little bit and then she kind of told me a little bit more. And I said, look, just tell me the whole story. Okay. I'm not just here to hear part of it and then go and tell the little nuggets that sound good. I'm going to take the whole story. You know, and, and I think that that's a big problem that a lot of people, um, they're afraid to come out and tell you the entire thing because it sounds so nuts. It sounds so crazy. But if they would do that, I think you would see 90 percent of these cases involve more than just a sighting of something. You'll hear people that are experiencers. That's why they saw what they did. They're catching glimpses of the other side because they have the eye. They can see that. If that makes any sense. I mean, you know, if you know what I'm saying, like in Spanish, it's called Ojo Dotado. But if, you know, in English, you know, it's like the eye, you can see the other side. You're seeing through that. And I think all it really is, is seeing the fourth dimension. Really? You're seeing in a higher density. I don't so know if you Kenny, guys have, have you had an experience. Um, I definitely had some uh, strange things happen. Uh, I'm more of a, 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 a again, originally started out as a flesh and blood type of guy. Um, I've never, unfortunately, although a lot of people tell me it's a good thing that I haven't seen <laughs> anything um, because, you know, like I see the lucky ones is the people that have seen something and the people that have seen something tell me that I'm the lucky one that I haven't because it's really kind of changed their lives. Um, I, I always call myself the guy who's late to the party. I always show up after something happened after somebody seen something um again uh being out in the woods you have weird experiences all the time um you hear things walking near you that you cannot see um of course you know animals are masters of their domain and can for some 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 sense stay camouflaged but uh, i mean i've i've seen strange um you know, lights in the woods that, you know, shouldn't be there, um, especially in our, our research area. I mean, there's no like, you know, gases or anything, you know, we know the area, just these strange lights that, you know, that, that show up and, you know, these phantom lights, if you will, some people call them fairies. Um, other people say it's something that's manifesting, um, you know, based off of, you know, certain things that you've done out in the woods. Um, but I, unfortunately I have not set eyes on anything. Um, I'm hoping to one day. Um, it, but at the same time, I'm, I'm hoping that it's something that doesn't, you know, scare me so much that I, I stopped studying the subject across the board because I mean, when it comes to like, I want everything to be flesh and blood because yeah. I just, I, I, I run from like the spirits, um, you know, I, you know, grown, growing up and, you know, in, in being a Christian, you know, it's, there's always that concern of something being attached to you and, and, you know, kind of like, you know, what Josh and Elijah were talking about with, um, uh, that project that's that they're working on. I'm not even going to say the name. Um, <laughs> that that you know, I just try to you know, I, I try to uh, avoid all that. Like I'll, I'll write about it and talk about it, but I won't go after something. For instance, if somebody says to me, "Hey, do you want to go into this old house? You know, and investigate it? You know, they say it's haunted. I'm like, 
nah, nah. You know, if they say to me, hey, you want to go explore this old house? It's, you know, I'd be like, yeah, that's cool. You know, I want to go in there and check it out. So uh, where I'm at right now is um, I want to see something, but at the same time, I really hope I don't. That means, oh, I get it. That means anything. <laughs> You know, I, I, I had my encounter with a Bigfoot, and that's where, you know, I, some days I kind of curse that because I say, uh, that's kind of got what got me started with all this as far as cryptids go. And, um, you know, I guess I haven't looked back. But, yeah, I, I, I it makes me wonder if I hadn't seen that, what I have done as far as, uh, <laughs> as, far as this goes. Uh, I, I had always done paranormal activity, you know, paranormal activity and, and looked into it since I got out of high school back in the seventies. But, um, uh, yeah, that's, um, uh, that's kind of what kicked it off for me. So Ron, uh, tell us about your experience. Well, again, anecdotal, but I, I think that I've had, um, enough that keeps me going. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that anybody would continue this unless you have something to keep on feeding off of, right? I, I think even Stan Gordon, whenever you ask him, he has never seen anything with his own eyes, but he has had enough anecdotal things happen that he keeps on going, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I see that he's going to be on the show next month or something like that. Yeah. If anybody has seen Stan Gordon, I'm going to put this in perspective. I'm 52 years old. I used to listen to Stan Gordon on the radio whenever I was in elementary school in the 1970s. I will see it of him at conferences, and he looks like 10 years younger than I do. I think, <laughs> I think that he has either had an alien encounter, and they've given him like the fountain of youth or around too much radiation from the, the spacecraft or whatever, but he looks unbelievably good. He's still kicking, and I love Stan. If it wasn't for Stan, I wouldn't be here. But um, I will tell you this, though. Um, so I've always had an interest in the paranormal, but I've never had any kind of encounter. Mm -hmm. um, but I was going to graduate school and uh, my brother and I were running a place uh, in Indiana, Pennsylvania. And uh, it was on the outskirts of town and bordered this, uh, this, uh, the university woods there. So it was a protected place. Uh, people would go up there walking every now and then, but for the most part, it was just this big desolate area where people could go up there and study and do whatever. Um, the first summer that we moved in there, we started to hear these whistling sounds um, it only happened whenever it wasn't raining. Um, it only happened between the hours of 12 and three o'clock in the morning, the witching hour, which is really scary. Um, and this went on for a while, this whoop, whoop sound like that. And of course, look, I had a passing interest. I thought this might be some sort of bird. I had no idea what was going on. Um, but the next year, the next summer, um, it starts happening and happening in earnest again. And uh, my brother and I said, you know, whenever this happens again, we're going to go out and we're going to investigate and find out what's going on. Um, so sure enough, a couple of days later, it was about a quarter till three in the morning and the whistling happens again. That whoop, whoop, that, you know, that repetition. Um, so any good story has to have a sword involved. So I grabbed a sword and my, my brother grabbed a baseball bat and we're in our 20s. You know, we're going to go out and investigate this thing. So we open up the door, and this is the first time we were ever outside whenever this thing was making the noise, and you could actually feel it reverberating inside your body. Mm -hmm. You know, I had only heard it from inside of the house before, but now that I'm outside, and it, like, gave me pause for a second. Even though I'm in my 20s, I was athletic back then at the time, and gosh darn it, I had a sword in my hand. What am I going to be afraid of, you know? So at the end of our yard, there was a grove of trees that led up into the big woods. And as we got closer, we knew that what was ever making that whistling sound was in that grove of trees. So we got, we, we started to approach it. Um, our eyes started to adjust and everything to the darkness. And we start hearing the whistling sound again. But this time, as the whistling sound is going on, we start hearing a growling. It was simultaneous. It was two sounds at once. And the growling was so loud that you could actually hear it taking in oxygen. And you could hear that it was a very wet sound as well, too. Mm -hmm. So we immediately ran because I'm not confronting a, a creature, you know, uh, that. So we went back into the house, locked all the doors and everything like that. And um, it never came back again, ever. That was the last time we heard that sound. 
So I started asking some neighbors, hey, have you guys ever had any kind of unusual things happen around here? And the one lady was working out in her garden. And she said, no, I've never heard any kind of sounds. But I will tell you, a few years ago, I saw a very large man going through my garbage at about 2 o'clock in the morning. So those kind of things happen. So um, I had no idea what to do. I mean, this was uh, 1995, I guess it was, 1996, something like that. And um, I immediately got onto the internet, which wasn't much then. And I Googled, um, I don't think Google was even existing then, but I put in there um, Bigfoot in Pennsylvania and one site came up, if you can believe it, one site. And that was Eric Altman's uh, mm -hmm. Bigfoot, uh, Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society. And um, I, my case was the first case that he, um, he, uh, he came out to investigate. Oh, my, is that right? First case, yeah. And that's what got me started. So I knew that there was something out there um, that, um, you know, people couldn't really explain. I still have no idea what happened. I didn't see anything. I can only tell you intellectually what I felt was going on and what, you know, I uh, kind of, uh, um, really affected you. It, it affects you mind, body, and spirit, doesn't it? It's mm -hmm. not one thing. It's not, it, it's not, oh, I saw this. It's, it's, I, I experienced it. Right. I mean, that's the big thing. Um, and uh, there was something that was said early, and all, all, all these guests on here are, are, are so worthy of these, of these sound bites that it's so great. Um, but I think that whenever you have an experience, it's almost like an unwritten contract between you and the subject, if that makes any sense. It's almost as if you are part of a, a switch, you know, you're part of that kind of connection. And you have to flip the switch on your side, and it has to flip the switch on, on its side, and it makes this circuit, this kind of agreement between the two of you. Um, to illustrate that even further, um, a few years ago, uh, there was a snowstorm, and I knew it was going to be hell with the Murphy family because my kids were going to be home from school. So, you know, I needed a cigarette at this point, so I went out to my car to grab a cigarette, and um the, the snow was all over the place, you know, a nice blanket of snow about seven o'clock in the morning, except strangely through my front yard was a set of tracks, um, not large tracks, very small tracks about the size of a five-year-old. And I know the size of a five-year-old's foot because I have five children. And um, there was these naked little tracks that went through my yard. And I thought, well, this is very, very strange. Um, and I, these were the tracks that I talked about. They appeared out of nowhere. They just began in my yard. But what had happened was it was a right track, a right track, then a right left track as if it stepped out of something or if it took a while to become completely physical, I have no idea. But the trackway led up to my window and whatever it was apparently appeared into my window and then went over the hill and then they vanished again. So isn't that kind of strange that somebody that is investigating Bigfoot had some sort of encounter like this where the thing came looking for me? And I think a lot of times whenever you talk to investigators, very strange things happen to them. And I'm, I'm thinking again, are we part of this world that we are kind of some sort of um, uh, paranormal hotspot? where things are picking up on us, you know, we're picking up on them. I think there's, there, there's, there's a plausibility to be said on that because some people seem simply to be gifted with this or cursed with this, uh, de depending upon which side of the fence you stand. Mm. Well, I, I, I know if you want to get rid of a possible Bigfoot, do like Ron did, take Excalibur out and go ahead. Ron, that'll do it. <laughs> well, actually, that did not work because I ran. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so josh i know you had a, a an upright canine or a dogman encounter why don't you tell us about it because i don't think i've ever heard it well it was a dark and stormy night no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> no to, to, kind of to, really quickly to touch on what you said ron i think that what you said makes a lot of sense because when you're investigating something and you're going in there expecting one thing and then something else happens, that happens a lot. Mm. Um, I'm going to tell the story about what happened to me. And then I'm going to give you an example of kind of what Ron was talking about. Um, this happened to me in 1990 and it was, uh, I guess 30 years ago. Um, 30, 
one years now. It'll be, you know, I guess this this coming October, which will be several months from now, and it'll be 32 years of months. Just time just seems to be going so fast. But I was with a friend of mine who's now a preacher in my hometown, and he, he we were very much bad little delinquent kids. Uh, got locked up a few times for doing various, you know, misdeeds. Um, and that night was no exception. We were throwing uh, eggs at cop cars. And we, mm. 15 year old kids out on Halloween. And my mother gave me a very generous curfew, which I still managed to break. Um, and so I was at, at my friend's mother's house and she was like my second mom and she had diabetes real bad and she couldn't drive and, and she was, she, she couldn't see at night, you know? And so my mom was very angry. So she basically told me, you walk home, pendejo. That's basically her response. And so uh, I started to take the tennis shoe express with my friend. We had another friend who lived kind of in between our two houses and he had a, he worked on bikes and his name was Daniel too. But we, 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 we called him by his last name, which was Henderson, like you, Elijah. And so he said, I'll walk you to Henderson's house. You know, we'll walk together and then you can ride a bike. He always had the bikes outside and I would just grab one. And I mean, we were buddies. We all played ball together. And so we were uh, walking. And when I see this thing about a block at the end of the next block up, and it looked like a dog. At first, it looked like a black German shepherd um, sitting in a ditch. And we thought it was our neighbor's dog, and but it, it looked way too big to me but he was kind of convinced so he walked up and started trying to call her um and she didn't respond and i said this is weird i knew something was wrong because not only was that dog or whatever not responding but then th there were other dogs in the neighborhood that should have been barking and freaking out they barked at everything and so i thought it was it was quiet you know there's nothing there's no sound and uh this thing was was moving back and forth like its front limbs and i noticed that it turned and looked at us. I said, I backed up. I was like, that's not a dog. It looks like a wolf. And he was like, what is a wolf doing in town? I mean, like, you know, of course this isn't a really big town and you know, a couple streets over and you're kind of out of town, but it's still in town, you know? And so it, it was just uh, such an aberration, you know, um, just to see that it was so not normal, you know, and it just, cause it, it just didn't look right. And it looked, when it looked at us, it had this huge head, and uh, I just remember like where the, what should have been paws came up and they were like, uh, like hands. And I was sitting there looking at this thing and I thought, oh my gosh. And you know, you kind of look down and time just kind of slows down and you remember all these weird, like, you know, but then other things you can't remember, you know, um, I just looked down and I had this like big drink, one of those big uh, circle K, the Dr. Peppers, whatever. And it was on the ground. I remember looking at the cup and the ice and staring at it. And I remember words and then my shirt, my neck was burning and my shirt was ripped because my friend had tried to literally drag me to grab me. He's apologized over and over again over the years. He told my wife the story, you know, at my nephew's graduation. He's like, I, I always felt bad about leaving him, um, but <laughs> I wasn't moving. I was just stuck in place. Uh, and my friend, I look and he's already like halfway back to his house. And uh, I'm standing there because this thing had gotten up and ran across the road on two legs and it just scared the the, the, the crap out of both of us but he ran and, and and i just stood there and then so i started walking with my jello legs you know it was like i just my legs were like wobbly you know and th there was a a big fence at that time and that the house next door because people that lived there had a bunch of pit bulls and the city had told them build this big fence or we're gonna make you give up you know whatever um and these people they were drug dealers and so it was a bad neighborhood and they were drug dealers, and, and so they ended up uh, eventually getting evicted. But they did actually put the fence up, and then shortly after that, they got raided. So anyways, I, I was walking by that fence, and that thing, that creature that people call the dog man, which I don't even like that term because it didn't look like a dog to me. It looked like a freaking wolf on two legs. It began to walk in between the two houses, and it got up to the fence, and it kind of stopped, and it was, you know, at that point, I wasn't looking directly at it. I was walking by it and just kind of like kind of seeing it in my peripheral and then looking down kind of at an angle. And I saw the foot, which looked like a weird claw, like it was like like hooked over the, the, the like at least two of the toes, if I remember correctly, were like hooked over like one of the chain links. And I just thought, what in the heck is that? You know, and when I finally looked up at it, it was staring right at me. And I was just like 
terrified. It was just it, the, the upper body looked like a like humanoidal, like like a, like a man, and the ba- it had the backward bent legs like a dog. It had the back legs of a dog, and it just looked timber wolfish, but like big straight pointy ears. Um, I've had somebody sculpt the the creature that I saw. In fact, hey uh, Anthony, can you can you grab me that uh, the Texas Wolfman? Uh, Charlie Perez, who I actually was working on a action figure line with, um, he sculpted this thing. And, and if I could, sh- I'll show the audience what it was that I saw. Uh, he's probably come the closest to depicting it correctly. Um, and this thing, seven and a half feet tall. And then it went back by the window, you know, of my friend's house and his family, some of his family members saw it through the window and it just walked back, you know, but at that point I had already gone, I didn't see that part. I had already gone up to the porch and was inside. And I, I just remember sitting there on the couch and I was probably on the couch for an hour, which I don't even, it felt like an eternity. And I just sat there uh, contemplating what I had seen. And it was up by the window at that point and everybody was freaking out looking at it. And I, I had no desire to go and try to take another look at it. I, I had seen enough. And uh, people have asked me over the years if I wanted to see it again. I said, heck no, I don't want to see it again. Um, I haven't gone out into the field looking for these things. I, I, I had my confirmation when I was 15. I know they exist. I know it's real. And then subsequently I talked to a bunch of people from my hometown and from the air, the surrounding areas over the years who've seen these things and absolutely confirmed that what I saw was real. It existed. The fact that it was able to manipulate the fence told me that this thing was flesh and blood. So for 30 years, almost 30 years, I'd say until December 2019, which would have been 29 years, you know, because it was, you know, at the end of October, uh, I, I was talking to my friend's brother. Now, this goes back to what you were saying, Ron, about how um, pe- people will 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 have like an experience, you know, Bigfoot, but then they end up seeing like what you, <laughs> Littlefoot, you know. Um, but I was talking to my friend's brother and he was actually remodeling a house down the street, which was known to be haunted. And so me and my nephew who just brought me this here, we were there talking to him in December, 2019. And he, when he was doing the remodeling on the house, I made a joke about that. I said, Hey, you know, I do a show now. And he goes, yeah, yeah. And I said, if you have anything weird happen, you know, let me know. And uh, he goes, you mean like what we saw that night back, you know, and he kind of touched on that. And I said, yeah, I was like, yeah, I was like, yeah, if you see any, any ghosts or demons, let me know. And he goes, well, he goes, you know, I haven't seen any here. He goes, you know, he was thoroughly convinced just like his mother before she passed that this thing was demonic. And I asked him that and I said, you, you really believe that it was like a demon? He goes, oh yeah, it was definitely demonic. He's like, there was black vapor coming off the back of its neck. 29 years. And I had never heard that. I, I had no idea that anybody saw that. I thought that what I saw was just flesh and blood. It manipulated the fence. I mean, you know, my friend, he was convinced it was flesh and blood. But uh, I, I told him, I was like, why did you never tell me that? He's like, you never asked. And I, he was right. I never, I'd never got that detail from him. And I guess that makes sense. Like why him and his mother always thought it was like a demonic entity because they saw this coming off of the back of its neck, which I didn't see. And so it took me all those years before I knew that. Mm. Um, so when we started talking about it, we hear this loud bang come from the master bedroom. So we all walk in there and there were these two uh, sawhorses and they had fallen inward on a flat surface. They had completely fallen inward and the, and the, 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 the wood was on the ground. And I was like, that's weird. So then we walked out, you know, and but it was weird how we were talking about this incident and then something, you know, happened. Um, which goes to, to what you were saying, Ron, it was just, a. it's so weird how it kind of gives you that confirmation, you know, this ladies and gentlemen is a rendition of it. You can see it right there. The only difference is that Charlie made the ears a little too far apart. What I remember seeing was, you know, I gave him the specifications and he came up with this amazing piece the ears were a little bit more up and down, like straight. Mm-hmm. They weren't off to the side like that. So, yeah, that that's a, that that's what it looked like right there. Now, he's got like a small tail on there, and I don't really remember the tail, but the backward bent legs, everything looks pretty pretty accurate. Like the the upper body, 
You know, it wasn't like a just gigantic, but it was big, built, very powerfully built, and it looked very muscular, like a guy that works out in the gym. Quite mm. That's um, very similar to the sightings that we get reported to us here in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Uh, something that looks like the underworld lichen. That same type of uh, thin, thin ways, barrel chest, muscular People say nine, eight, nine, ten foot tall. You know, uh, never, never attacks, but holds its ground. Type of thing, very menacing. Uh, many times we've had hunters come up to these things, and they're I don't know if it's infrasound or psychic or something, but they they literally feel like they've got to back away from it. That it's telling them to back away from it. And they do. I mean, they, they, you know, they'll hold a gun, but they'll back away. So, Elijah, one of the things I was going to ask you, um, because I know that you, and I, and I, and I lamented this, and I told you this. I, there were some guys that had, well, not there was one guy, and then his friend, but there were several of them that were teenagers that were there in the LBL, and they saw. Uh, what looked like a little herd. I don't want to call them a herd or a pack. I don't know, but they looked like these little, uh, I, I don't know what to call them. I call them devil monkeys. You know, and Elijah, you've, yeah. we've talked about this. These little devil monkey looking creatures, they came out of the LBL and somebody gave me that story back in 2019 when I was maybe six months into my show. And I was like, what is this, dude? And I was like, <laughs> The guy admitted to me that they had been drinking and he was only 19 or he was 16 at the time. And the oldest kid was 19. And I thought, well, you know, they're not the best witnesses. And so I made the mistake of kind of throwing it out and saying, well, you know, and then I never heard from him again. And I, I kind of threw the email out there. You know, I got rid of it because I thought it sounded kind of silly until later on. I started getting more accounts of this and I wish I could get back in touch with this person. But I'm pretty sure I kind of aggravated them because I they asked me if I believed them, and I was very blunt about it. And I said, I've never heard of anything like that. That just sounds weird. Mm. Um, did hear dog well, man know, type stuff, but this thing sounded like a monkey. That, uh, there's what? a gentleman who gave an account, I think it may have even been Kumbo, that said uh, there's a woman who reported her husband was killed by a couple of monkey men down in Land Between the Lakes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember that story. I heard that myself. Yeah, I never knew what to make of that. Devil I sure what be that what? Well, I mean, what do you guys think? I mean, do you guys think that those are it's is that is that a type of dog man or is that just an well, absolute I, I, I have heard a lot of weird stuff down from down there. Uh I mean not just canine, but other weird things as well. Humanoid sightings, strange humanoid sightings. But uh, I've heard some pretty harrowing upright canine sightings, too. And, in fact, th there was an incident, if I remember right, where th these this family was down at the park there, and there was a ranger there, and they showed this ranger these long footprints with claws. And when they took him to it and showed it to him, so they, they went away and... Till the next day, they had to come back for something. They lost something, and they went came back to look for it. And when they got there, that whole area where the where the claw footprints were were found, all the turf and everything was pulled up, like somebody took a bulldozer and just took it out of there. Mm. So, yeah, I, I don't know what that's all about, uh, but that was at LDL. I mean LBL and. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. You know, I, I, you know, I've heard a lot of Bigfoot sightings in there too. So, you know, and that, that's another thing. How many Bigfoot or upright canine sightings get misidentified or could be one or the other? You know, I've yeah. always wondered that. Um, and I, I think here in Pennsylvania, we get that occasionally mm -hmm. because a lot of times we'll get somebody say, yeah, I saw Bigfoot, but it had a, a muzzle on it. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I saw a dog man, it had a flat nose, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. In 1999, I was out with um, uh, Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society. We were doing an investigation with Sam Sherry. And if anybody knows anything about history, <laughs> oh, yeah, Sam. 
Yeah, so uh, he had an experience about 1984 where he allegedly he saw Bigfoot, and then he spent up to his dying day trying to prove that there was still a Bigfoot out there, right? Because mm-hmm. he didn't want anybody to call him crazy. But we were out in the middle of the Chestnut Ridge, and uh, we were talking, just talking about his investigations and his research. And he looked at me and he said to me, um, I uh, have seen two different types of Bigfoot out here. Uh, one of them is the big lumbering kind that you you know you see whenever you think about Bigfoot, uh, you know, very benign type of creature. Then he kind of pulled in closer and looked side to side and he said, but there's another type of Bigfoot out here as well, too. It's a lot thinner than the big the other Bigfoot out here. It has a dog-like muzzle and it hunts in packs. Mm-hmm. Now, this was 1999, and I never heard it. A part of our vernacular wasn't dogman yet, you know. So you would have to think about werewolf. So I think that whatever you were talking about these kind of things, I think that it has been for a while. These things have been reported as Bigfoot, and now maybe a lot of Bigfoot reports are being seen as dogmen. But I. Think I, so. I yeah, I think so because you need to have the word right as part of our 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 culture in order to identify with what you're seeing. Well, you know, and if you you talk to Eric Altman, he'll tell you. I mean, he he was looking into a case around 2013 or 2014 where he was sure it was something other than a Bigfoot. Uh, and, you know, it could have been very well been something canine, but it was making all kinds of crazy noises that he didn't believe was a Bigfoot. Uh, you, know, you know, and that's just what I'm saying. You know, when, when, you're, when you're looking into Bigfoot and for, you know, yeah, Pink, Bigfoot, Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society and others, um, who's to say that some of these varieties may be something else? And, you know, we've gotten all kinds of, uh, we've had the quadruped canines that have look like huge hyenas with wolf heads. And, uh, you know, it, get, it gets to be a weird variety of things. But, uh, yeah, I, I think there's some misidentification that's definitely going on. One of the, the, the listeners had a done something here, Lon. Tam- Tamara0142, way back earlier, she said uh-huh. something. Uh, I'm trying to find the comment. I think it was at 8:57. I tried to earmark it in my mind. She, anyway, she, what she said was, uh, "Do these things come from? Or do they uh, do orbs change into these things?" I want to make sure that that's what she said here. Before. Yeah, I remember seeing it. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, you know, this is something that Stan mentioned to me a while back, and it it does seem to come up a lot. A lot of the a lot of the Bigfoot sightings that people have been reporting in around this area, you know, here in all Pennsylvania, there's other phenomena attached to it. Now, of course, you know, Stan's been talking about UFO and Bigfoot activity for years now, but there are there have been more and more investigations where after after the actual sighting or encounter, that uh, the investigator would go to the area and when they get there. They'd, be see, they'd see a lot of orbs. Mm-hmm. And that seems to be showing up more and more. And, you know, the orb sightings, for whatever they are, you know, of course, we get the orb sightings in, in alien encounter, you know, cases all the time. But we're getting more and more with, with Bigfoot and, and upright canines. Now, Another listener, uh, Scarborough uh, Sasquatch Station. Uh-huh. Made a comment that I wanted to, to address that seemed pretty uh, relevant. They were asking about what what what, what is a a shed like I can't wait I lost it it was just there. They were asking about people shape shifting and what what causes it what 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 it could be I guess was the question. Uh-huh. Um. Uh, here it says, "How do shapeshifters change from human, wolf, human? Any idea how they can change? Is it natural or black magic? Obviously, I don't think it would be a natural uh, uh, process, but I do believe through some sort of, uh, you know, magic. I guess I don't know how to say that. I mean, that's that's a I don't know. Is it the subjective term? What what would you call that? I mean, magic." to some societies would be, uh, science, you know, to us, like, you know, we can, we can, if you went back to a primitive time and showed them a lighter, they would be like, Whoa, this guy's making magic. You know, that's magic. 
Mm -hmm. um you know now you just look at it and you go that's a big it's a big lottery you know <laughs> um it's not magic at all and, and, and there's nothing really even all that sciencey about it but yeah i mean i think it's just it just all depends on the society but i do believe that there is a way to do this and people think i'm crazy when i tell them that but look i got a report off of lake travis there was a guy that was a security and i know a lot of security people have been doing it for years i have, I have a company and we, we work with all kinds of different people and he was out there. They were doing the pest control in the early months of the spring, you know, because they go and they 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 do the pest control on the yachts and stuff. People want their, their – because those boats that dock there, they get a lot of spiders and things in them, and, and which I hate. But anyway, we had a guy that was doing security out there, and so he told us a crazy story. Um, he told me and three of my guys, he told us that he, he had a pest control guy come out there, and when they were walking out there to the docks – um, they saw this, what looked like a dog, you know, swimming in the water and they thought, Oh, there's something swimming in the water. And it had like a dog like head as it got closer. They thought, Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a wolf. <laughs> it's, it's a black. And then as it got closer, they were like, that is not a wolf. That isn't a dog. I don't know what that is. And it looked, it, it really elongated. And they, they saw the weird looking feet coming up from behind it, which that's not going to be, you know, and it looked more humanoidal in shape. And it didn't have the the dog like doing the dog paddle thing. It, it was like a man swimming, like like his front was doing a dog paddle, but his back legs were kind of kicking back and forth. And they were like, "Dude, what in the heck is that?" Well, here's the weird story, and, and I've told this story on my show. Like th th it got to the shore. When, when this thing got like got up out of the water, it was on all fours. It immediately came up once it got completely on the land popped up onto two legs and as it continued to walk it began to shrink before their eyes like just began to get smaller and smaller and the hair began to fall off of it turning into like a green mist it was coming off of this creature and this thing turned into a uh, swarthy skinned native american looking person with long hair and, they, and he just kind of shook off like that and he turned and looked at them and he just kind of nodded like what's up and then went right into the woods, completely naked. Um, and and this story was told to me. I asked both of these guys, and I got a hold of the pest control guy, and that, that was a chore in itself. But I got a hold of him, and I said, hey, can you talk to me about this? He kind of blew me off at first. I was persistent. And then the guy said, look, I'm going to tell you what I saw. I mean, this was identical. To, they had the same story. It wasn't, you know, they didn't, I don't believe they were deviating. And I, and I believe that I believe them. I don't think they concocted this. There was nothing to be gained by it. Uh, me and three different people uh, heard this story. And so I, I, you know, we went to go eat lunch afterwards. There's me and my brother and a couple of other people. And we were talking about this and we're like, what is to be made of that? What do you think? And we, we came up with all kinds of theories and ideas. Um, you know, a guy in a suit. I don't know. I mean, you know, but th the way that they were describing the, it was like literally morphing. I mean, does that mean that werewolves exist? No, I'm not saying that, that these things are werewolves, but could that be one of the possibilities? Because we have skinwalkers. We have stories of skinwalkers doing all kinds of crazy things, dude. Um, I had a friend of mine, he's a Ute, and he told me, he's like, don't trust deer, don't trust coyotes, because around here you don't know if that's really what that is. I mean, he told me that point blank, you know, I mean, these things will jump across the road and make you wreck and it's a skinwalker. And so when you hear stories like that, of like these, uh, these skinwalker type creatures or, or entities, whatever, then you know that there is something more going on than just like a, uh, uh, a flesh and blood like creature that just lives in the woods all the time or whatever. There's more than just that going on. Uh, I had a, a woman on my, on my show who has a very large group, um, you know, on, on Facebook. And she, she came on my show and she talked about what she believed was a werewolf. She saw a werewolf, um, you know, the clothes were there, there was a pile of clothes. And then she ran into this thing out into the, out in the, in the middle of the woods. It was a giant looking creature. Um, you, she knew it was a, a not a, a dog man as we think of as like something that's that way 24 seven, it was a shapeshifter. Um, you know, I, I really think that that could be a possibility. Um, when you start to get deep, really deep, you start to go back into the legends that we have. Uh, I did a show on Bible theology. I think it's very important, you know, because I did it with Paul Wallace. He's from the fifth kind. He's a good guy. And we talked about, you know, we touched on a lot of different subjects, how the Bible translations aren't 
correct because of the, the language barrier. Um, and I think that what, 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 where we come from as a people, I think that we, I do believe in the one God, the most high, but I, I also think that we may have been seated here by a population that resembled us and they made us in their image. And I, and I, and I touched on this on my show on Tuesday that I believe that these Nephilim, these dogmen or whatever you want to call them could have been something that was created by them to, uh, control us the humans. You know, now somebody asked me the question, why did they make us so diminutive and small? I was like, you wouldn't want something your same size, you know, breeding and getting out of control. So you had to make them smaller so that if they got out of control, you could just thump them, you know, punt them across the room or whatever. And so that's why they were giants. That's why they were so large. And of course, they're going to make these their guardians, their guard dogs, the dog man, they're going to be bigger. And stronger, more powerful than us, but not quite as big and as strong as them, so they could still be subdued. But hey, this this human is getting out of getting out of line. He doesn't want to use his pickaxe to, to mine for gold or whatever tool they gave us. Um, now he thinks he's going to leave. We'll go ahead and get him and bring him back. But then the flood comes. This is just a theory. But then the flood comes and and it wipes out all these creatures, or at least a bunch of them, because it didn't flood the entire earth. Now, archaeologically, we know that there was flooding. Um, so this would have been an antediluvian period, but after that, it says in the book of Enoch that they became evil spirits for all time. So what, they just went into the fourth dimension where, you know, where they originally came from, you know, as forms that can come in and out of our world. Uh, Linda Godfrey posed the theory that when they come to our world, the longer they're here, the, the more they, they have to actually they're physical. They become more physical. They have to eat. They have to, you know, use the bathroom and do all these things. That's why you see them eating roadkill, you know, in Elkhorn, you know, Wisconsin. Um, you know, you see them on the side of the road, you know, eating deer and hogs. Um, because when they're in our world, they're living by our rules. You know what I mean? Um, but, but they are really just from another dimensional plane of existence. Um, you know, in the Kabbalah, if, and I'm not like advocating everybody go and read about magic or whatever, but if you read this, it talks about demons or whatever we know of as demons as Christians in, in the Jewish faith. It talks about them as uh, creatures that were from another another universe that was compressed up in, uh, upon itself, like it, you know, compressed, and they became fragmented beings. So that's why the demons look like a mismatch of different animal parts or whatever. I think that that could be making a reference to the antediluvian period when these things were roaming around freely and then something happened and now you got these weird, you know, types of creatures or whatever, you know, I mean, that's another way to look at it. I mean, I don't know. I, I just think if you go down the rabbit hole far enough, it, it takes you back to the Anunnaki and whatever tampering they were doing, the fallen, you know, and they were not supposed to do that. They were sent here for a specific reason, and they decided to do whatever they wanted to do. And their king or kings set themselves up as gods. And, you know, they lived to be thousands and thousands of years, which also coincides with the yugas, you know, the different time periods. The Dwarpa Yuga, which I think ended with the flood, which I think in, the, in those days people lived to be 10,000 years. And in the Tetra Yuga before that, they lived to be, you know, uh, you know, that was a thousand years. I'm sorry, Dorpa Yuga. The Tetra Yuga was 10,000 years and the Satra Yuga, 100,000 years. I mean, Michael Cremo, he talks about that. I think there's some validity to that. And I think that with these creatures, where they come from, um, within the earth, you know, in the book of Job, when, when God talks to Satan and he says, Where have you been? He says, I've been walking to and fro upon and within the earth. I think that's very telling. I think that passage is very telling because he's telling God that he dwells within the earth. He spent some time there. I mean, he's been up under the earth doing whatever he's been doing, um, you know, and so he's Shaitan. He's, you know, the, the evil one, the dark one or whatever. Of course, he's going to have minions and, and they're going to live somewhere. And I think that their ability to be metaphysical and, and shape shift and all that, I think that it can spill over into humans because I think that, that some people learn to open up more strands of DNA. And I think it actually can they can they can perform these these types of rituals and this magic. Um, Elijah, we've talked about this, about the granny witches and, of course, the, the, oh, the yeah, Amish definitely. and law me and you spoke not too long ago about the Amish um, and how they have a book uh, which they practice a magic called powwow. And they have a book called My Companion. And in those books, 
they my long lost have. friend. Long lost friend. I've yeah. actually got a copy of that. Yeah, and so you know, it, I'll break it, it, really but I got. Weird. It. I mean, the esoteric. You know, I mean, it's just it's it's crazy. I mean, like I've seen spells. I've been to Culanderas and Brujinas. I don't partake of it, but I've I've interviewed them. I've talked to them, and they've told me, yeah, I can put a spell on you and make you, you know, weak and and feeble and senile, and they can do all kinds of things. They can afflict you in in so many different types of ways. Um, you know, my friend's uh, mother, she's Vietnamese. She's a, a medicine woman, and she she can do all kinds of things to you. Um, you know, she put me on the phone with this woman from Vietnam that, that told me that I had an uncle that died when he was 18. His name was Paul. She had no way to know that. She's like over there in Saigon. Like, how the heck would she know that? Um, you know, and, and so magic, I think it's real. I mean, I think that these people can really do these things. And I think if it's practiced the way that they practice it, there could be shapeshifters, things going on that, that we just don't understand, which to us right now, it's magic, but eventually someday science will catch up to it and it will be accepted as a science. Well, I'm gonna have um, I'm gonna have Vincent put a photograph up here, and we all have seen it. It's the Beast of Seven Shoots. Now, mm -hmm. what the hell is this thing? I'll tell you, I've got a little story behind this. The guy who took this photograph first contacted me about it. And that was, I don't even know the year, was a 2008 2009 i can't remember but anyway he showed it to me and i this is before i really got into the upright canine dog man thing now this was up in quebec the seven shoots uh provincial park and uh the more and more I looked at this thing, I don't know what it was holding. People say it was holding a white dog. I don't know what it was holding. But uh, I'd like to get your comments on that and what you guys think this actually was. It, it looks like an upright baboon, doesn't it? It looks like it looks like a bipedal... I don't know. <laughs> it's a yeah. huge animal, though. Um yeah, the, the 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 like that would be my first impression that we're looking at something with the head of a baboon. Um, it has almost the kind of long arms as one too. I see. Um, just strange. Yeah, just strange. Or monkey or that way look that people talk about. What do you think, Josh? <laughs> I'll let Kenny go first. I, I've been talking too much. I want to, Kenny, give me your, give, give us uh, your opinion on that. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Um, when Ron said baboon, that's the first thing like, like I thought of. It um, does have like that baboon head. Now mm -hmm. I, um, like no, no, no neck. And the first yeah. thing, like I, when I saw the, what, you know, that, that white thing, like it's holding something, like I saw it kind of, kind of as pink and i was looking at it like you know is that like a pig like <laughs> I, I i don't know is and, and it looks like yeah it looks like it's kind of got like a snout dinopithecus uh mason county texas i got reports of these kids who were shooting fireworks off and they described to me what i think were was a dinopithecus i think it was it was a, it, to me it's a prehistoric baboon looking creature it didn't it didn't, I mean, it, yeah, dog man in the way that it had a snout, but I mean, like a baboon or a mandrel. That's the only thing I could think of, you know, like, but it doesn't have the, the, the color, you know, the colorful well, snout. The, but the guy who took the photograph, he, I had asked him to go back down where he took it at and to try to measure where he thought it stood at and the height and everything. And he, it was him. Actually, he he and three other people went down there again uh, a couple of days later, and the best they can measure was this thing stood about seven and a half foot. And they did go back through and look for any evidence, uh, but he said he really couldn't find much of anything. It was so heavy in there. You know, it was in the middle of summer. Of course, you can see all the leaves and everything. So, um, 
the one thing that's interesting to me is I've been trying to find any evidence of anybody seeing anything in that area. I don't even think there's a Bigfoot report that's come out of there. And any and that place is huge and it's perfect Bigfoot habitat. So could it be a when, Bigfoot? You had said that they that they went back. Did they by chance take any pictures of that area again? They um, did. They, they did. did. Okay. And I don't have them. Vincent said that it looks like a silverback with a baboon face. To me, this looks like a maybe a prehistoric mandrel. Yeah, I mean, you know, Dinopithecus is definitely yeah. a prehistoric uh, baboon. I think that those things are running around out there too. I mean, I think that we have some uh, some creatures that uh, are definitely just throwbacks, and they're still there. Mm. Yeah, to play mm. devil's advocate, though, I mean, I could probably make an argument that it's also. You know, a, a, a tree, and we're 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 seeing something that's actually not there as well, which is so interesting. What Kenny said. I mean, it would be great to go back there and photograph those spots to see if anything else uh, appears there. You know, what was actually there? Well, he he, he said it was moving. That's okay. how, that's how it caught his attention, and he said when he went back there, it went back there. All right. Uh, I don't know. I mean, this thing has confounded me for for years. And uh, every, one, every once in a while, I go back and look at it. I've actually broke it down to sections at, at one point to try to figure out what the hell this thing was. But, um, you know, out of all the things I've gotten over all the years, I think this is probably one that's confounded me as more than anything. There's, yeah, there's a close-up they hit. It's a little yeah, It looks more canine-like from that angle. Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. it's weird it is i think weird. barton would would be able to shed some light on that we need to show him that one elijah because barton the the sykesville monster um i'm, I'm sorry uh, spotsville monster uh you know he's writing he's still writing that book and now that he's changing jobs he's been having a little more time i'm hoping that he'll finish it he talked about these two different creatures that were they had a, I guess, a symbiotic relationship because one of them was Bigfoot looking, um, but it had uh, the dog man face, but the ears weren't, didn't stick up. The ears were at the, on the side of the head. Elijah, you've heard Barton talk about this, right? Oh, we lost him. Well, anyway, Barton told me that there were two different creatures and one of them looked more like a, a werewolf and the other one looked kind of like a, a Bigfoot, but it had the ears on the side, but it had a snout which uh, it looks very much like that beast of seven shoots photo. And and so when Barton Nunley told me that my, that that's, that's what came to mind was like beast of seven shoots, you know, and we were talking one night and he was describing to me how they would be seen together too. It wasn't, they were, they were different, distinctly different creatures, but yet they were running around together. And before people say, Oh, well that doesn't make any sense. Well, why do you see a dog men hanging out with coyotes or, or even little dogs? I mean, we've heard of stories of these, uh, things, you know, and, and it's just, uh, what, what are they? I have no idea. Um, why they do what they do. <clears throat> I mean, I can't answer that. I just, another thing that's really odd is you, you and, and I, and I, I told somebody this recently, um, I had somebody ask me, they said, why is this rake looking creature, this uh, translucent, you know, really skinny, pale humanoidal creature that crawls around? Mm. I know, Lon, one of the stories that you uh, that I read on in one of your books that really intrigued me about Penelope. Um, yeah. That one really stuck with me, dude. I mean, it yeah, was it's so in my, It's in my new book, actually. But uh, yeah, the Penelope sightings up in the Sierra Nevadas, that's pretty bizarre. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and quite frankly, I, I didn't even really come up with the name until I talked to one of the rangers up there. And, yeah, and then it was seen like crossing the road on all fours, too. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, it's, you know, uh, it's, it's weird. I mean, this whole this whole pale humanoid phenomena is just bizarre. I mean, I mean and that's all I can say it is. I mean, it just seems. Yeah. Well, there's another picture. That's my sighting. Now, if you guys looked at that, if that, if you, I had, I had a forensic artist develop that picture of my sighting from 1981, 
and this is what I saw. Now, if you saw that thing and you had a gun or if you had your intentions to shoot a Bigfoot, would you shoot that or would that be too human for you? Yeah, far too human. Yeah, way, yeah, way, 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 way too human. Absolutely. Truth be told, I wouldn't shoot it in general unless well, I wouldn't either. Me. But I'm just saying, let's say, um, but you had to make a determination. If it was attacking uh, me, I'd, I'd go for it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, attacking is yeah. different. Yeah. Well, I was within 40 foot of this thing. It was about eight foot, and it looked just like that. And I've always described it as looking like a Neanderthal. And I think that's probably a, as good a description as anything. But it did look more human. Uh, now, the body was huge. You know, it was definitely male. I saw the genitalia in this thing. And, you know, it was it was just huge. But I, this, is, this was before I even started looking into any type of cryptos or any type of Bigfoot or anything. But I had my encounter with this thing. So... I, I really didn't even think of Bigfoot when I saw it. I didn't know what the hell I thought it was, to be honest with you. Well, Lon, you, you had told me that you your your parents had ran an antique store, right? They they used to collect antiques. Collect antiques. And you had told me that you had seen spirit type mm. you know things. Yeah. And so, I mean, there again, it <coughs> seems like a lot of people that see dogmen and, and different creatures uh, you know th they they tend to people that have seen spirits i mean oh. I, I most every witness i've talked to has seen yeah. a ghost of some kind it's, it's well, very I, rare that you just talk to somebody that's all they've seen i'm an intuitive and i've always been an intuitive and even when i was i had an encounter when i was nine at gettysburg i um had something happen that convinced me that i was different so yeah i i've always been intuitive i could detect spirit energy around me i didn't necessarily see manifestations though i i have my mind's eye have seen a lot of different things uh you know i've always wondered if with my experiences that i've had with cryptids because i had a winged humanoid sighting in 88 what really was pre yeah oh yeah was I predestined to see that thing because of what's going on in Chicago now with my investigations? Because quite frankly, you know, that whole thing has taken a life of its own. You know, it's, you know, we, we started getting as 2011 was the first sighting, but 2017 is when it really started picking up. Uh, and, you know, we're getting more and more and it's continuing on all these years. But what I saw in 1988 was very similar to what people are seeing in Chicago now. Uh, the red, the whole red eyes, dark, able to propel itself without unfurling its wings, that type of thing. Yeah, jumping straight up. Yeah, I got one yeah. from, uh, from funny, we were talking about Pennsylvania. Ron talking about Pennsylvania. This is in Philadelphia. Um, a guy was walking home. This happened, I think, in 1997. Um, and the, he was walking by an abandoned apartment. Well, it was an under renovation apartment complex. Nobody was living there. And he saw somebody sitting up there on the second or third floor. I can't remember which, but as he walked by it, it stood up and, and at an angle kind of over the railing and then just went straight up and then began to fly away and it scared the crap out of him. And he's there walking by himself in the dark, you know, and he's like, that's crazy. I mean, it just looked like a man. And then it was like, whoop, and the wings were still behind it. And it just looked like a, a person that had jumped, like jumped up in the air, like at an angle. Um, what I was going to say about the pale crawler creatures, th they they tend to be in areas where Bigfoot and Dogman run around. And I asked somebody uh, recently if they thought that they could be that could be their form, and then they take on the form of a Bigfoot or a Dogman. They said, "No, nah, they don't believe that." And, well, I don't know. The, why are they either. always found in the same area? I'm, the only thing I can think of is like how lions and leopards, leopards live up in the trees. These humanoidal, pale humanoidal creatures tend to live up in trees. Um, and then, of course, lions, they, they run around in packs. And oftentimes you'll find dogmen in groups, just like Bigfoot. They're not always alone. But these pale humanoidal creatures are almost always alone. And they, they are always the alone. Yeah, kind of like a leopard, you know. It's a heck of a way to make a living, but uh, to live in yeah. dogman country. But uh, 
Yeah, I um, like I said, I wrote a, a book that just came out about these. I call it the meme humanoids because I based on maybe that some of these sightings may have been uh, thought forms from memes or you know, uh, just like Slender Man and those type of beings. But um, I don't know. I mean, even right after writing the book, I have really no idea. Are we are we experiencing some type of um, new humanoid type species on our earth plane that we are we're seeing the nexus of this thing i have no idea i have no idea i i, I kind of leave that question up in the, up in the air for whoever reads the book to answer or to give their opinion to somebody somebody actually gave me an idea one day um, one of my listeners and she said that she asked the, the question when I had talked about the Anunnaki that, that if they are, cause she believes that like, you know, the stitching work that, that they're like mm -hmm. you know, from Nibiru. And if they are to return, are these creatures like the dog man and these other types of, you know, cryptid type creatures like these pale humanoidal, if they were cultivated and created in labs by the, by the Anunnaki, Okay, like in Genesis six, it says that they they bred with the daughters of you know men of man, and that they they you know they had all these, and then they created all kinds of abominations. Um, a lot of people get the idea that they were breeding with these animals, but I think it's pretty obvious what they were doing was genetic splicing, and they were creating hybrids. And maybe, like I said, with the with the dog man, that they are a type of guardian animal. Uh, not only do they guard their their portals their entry points and things like that, but they could be something that could be used to go after and seize people who, whatever, uh, if the Anunnaki returned, would they be able to just put out a signal and where they awaken all these creatures and these creatures that once, you know, were ruled by them, it's in their DNA to follow them and to do what, to do their bidding. And I thought that's a horrific thought. Um, they come back uh, basically for all intents and purposes, an alien species, which is what we would be too. Mm. Although we've been living here, you know, thinking, Hey, this is our planet. And then they come back. And the first thing they do is start, you know, uh, kind of like you know, the show horn, you know, and they start using it to cr call these creatures to them and to do whatever and to wipe us out. Mm. Um, that's a horrific thought. And it's actually, it sounds like the beginning of a horror movie, you know, like what could, you know, what could come of that, you know, but, uh, yeah, she, she posed that to me and I thought, I don't know what would happen, but that that's, that's terrifying. You know, it's something that I've thought about and I thought, man, that would be like the most awful thing of these things just running in the streets. And then when you try to shoot them, it doesn't really do anything. <laughs> it doesn't really hurt them. You just got pieces of flesh flying off of them because they're just really animated flesh. Um, I don't know. Well, guys, I think I'm going to wrap this up. So, first of all, I want to thank each of, each one of you for coming on here. Uh, I'd like to have each and each of you tell the audience how they can contact you uh, if you got any books and maybe something's coming up that you're going to be involved with. So, let me start with Josh and uh, to talk to our folks. Um. You know, I'm supposed to be working on a book and I'm so busy with my, my business and, and doing all the things that I'm doing. I just can't even find the time to, to, I wish I could get one put out. I can say this, that Lon, Lon does a lot of good work and, and so do you, uh, Kenny, your book, uh, American cryptids is top notch, man. Let me tell you. Um, and I'm sure your next book is going to be great too. Um, uh, so, you know, as far as I go, just, podcast comes on tuesdays uh, our uh, fridays is the podcast and we we, we distribute it on 12 different platforms uh, tuesday is a live stream we do two or three hours uh, you know usually on the live stream people ask questions sometimes people come on and tell their stories or i tell people stories and uh, we do a q a and uh, we have a good time it's paranormal roundtable and if you got any stories you want to send me um, and we can talk about it or whatever. It's Josh Turner at PRTpodcast.com. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely, uh, uh, tell, uh, advocate, you know, Lon, I do, uh, get books from Lon that he, he autographs and I give those away as giveaways. So 
you know, if you listen to my show, you might get one of Kenny's books. You might get one of Lon's books. You never know. And I appreciate that, Josh. Yeah. How about you, Ron? Um, well, let's see what I'm going to be doing next. Things are starting to open back up. Uh, so in a few months, I will be at the Kecksburg UFO Festival in beautiful downtown Kecksburg, Pennsylvania uh, with Stan Gordon. Uh, that's going to be uh, the next to the last weekend in July. So if anybody's in Western Pennsylvania, the Kecksburg Festival is indeed going to be up and running. Um, and I will be with Kenny, I believe, in August, and we will be up in uh, – Lake Champlain. Oh, well, we will be up in Vermont together, so uh, I'll get to finally meet him in person. Um, you can get all of my books on Amazon, Ronald L. Murphy Jr. I've written books on Bigfoot and werewolves and lake monsters and witches and all that other good stuff. Um, and uh, Or you can, you know, social media as well, too. Uh, Ronald L. Murphy Jr. on Facebook. You can like me uh, or what have you. Uh, and I always look forward to chatting to people as well, too. And I was so glad to see Dave Scott from Spaced Out Radio at the very <laughs> final moment comes on in to say hello. So it was good to see him here as well. How are you, Kenny? All right. Yeah. Um, so I can be contacted via Facebook, Instagram, um, or my website, which is www.kwirish.com um, or the cryptopunkologist.com. Uh, some of the locations I'm going to be at um, March 25th to the 27th, I'm going to be in Rochester, New York at the Rochester Parafest. Uh, May 7th, I'm going to be in um, Townsend, Tennessee at the Smoky Mountain Bigfoot Festival. I'll be there with Ron Moorhead, Ken Gerhard, and um, uh, uh, our friends, uh, guys from the Mountain Monsters. Uh, July 30th, I'll be in Michigan at the Michigan Bigfoot Conference. Um, Lyle Blackburn's going to be there as well. Um, like uh, Ron had mentioned, um, August 6th, uh, we're going to be in Port Henry, New York at the uh, Champ Lake Champlain um, Monster Festival. Uh, September 24th, I'll be in Whitehall, New York at the Sasquatch Festival. And um, last that I've got on here uh, is um, – there's a there's a new paracon um that they're putting together and i'm just uh, uh, going to be a vendor at it so i wanted to be at the first one it's called the sleepy hollow paracon um it's going to be in tarrytown new york that is october 22nd um as far as books um i've got uh, american cryptids in pursuit of the elusive creatures um that you can get on amazon you can get it at some other locations but obviously amazon's the easiest that was released through beyond the fray publishing uh, i've got another one coming out late summer of this year called um international cryptids and legends um looking forward to having that out and um having a forward written by a good friend of mine um and i have um two young readers chapter books one called stanley Riker and the bigfoot runaround which was released through dark moon publishing and um just recently back in i'd say september october i released um Alexandra and the Moonlight Caper, another young reader's chapter book that was published through uh, Hanger, Hanger One Publishing, um, who Doug Hishek, the producer and creator of Monster Quest, uh, owns that publishing company. So um, I, I love talking with people. And uh, so, you know, definitely reach out to me if you have any questions or you just want to say hi. And how are you, Elijah? Well, uh, I reckon my main platform is going to be on YouTube, uh, the Cryptid Studies Institute. I make all sorts of documentaries about things that have happened over in East Tennessee, over in my neck of the woods of Clarksville, Tennessee, Kentucky, all sorts of different things. Uh, so that's going to be my main platform. People can reach me there, Facebook, Instagram, I'm, I'm on a couple of different places like that. I reckon the next project I got going on is I got a documentary coming out about Indian Mountain, Tennessee. It's just about just a rock's throw away from Land Between the Lakes, so it's it's had quite a bit of share of interesting stuff going on there. Got a gentleman who swears he's seen the Shunk of Warwick in there, uh, so that ought to provide a lot of interest for people. And it, eventually, somewhere down the line, I plan to do one more part of the Bell Witch series to close things up on that particular series, but I don't know when. Uh, so that's what I got going on. Well, gentlemen, I appreciate you taking the time to come on with us this evening. And hopefully we'll come back again. Hey, Ron, I wanted to tell you, it was a pleasure meeting you 
And uh, I'd like to get together with you about your books. Um, I do. I would like to 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 read those and and check them out. And maybe you can uh, send me some of those autographed, and I could use them on my on my show as giveaways. Just uh, absolutely, my brother. Absolutely, yeah. Just get in touch with me, and uh, we'll make that happen. Absolutely, yeah. Just find me, yeah. Because I've been I was looking forward to meeting you. I just I had never never met you or spoken to you, so. Well, I appreciate it. Yes. We'll have to have each other on each other's shows sometime too. Yeah. Lon, thank you for the invite. I really appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, no thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you, you, brother. Okay. Well, you all have a good weekend and you take care. Bye bye, guys. Now, if you have an unexplained encounter or sighting, feel free to contact me directly at Lon Strickler at phantomsandmonsters.com or through the Phantoms and Monsters blog site. Also, if you'd like to have your encounter or sighting read on the show, please forward it to my email at lawnstrickerfamsandmonsters.com. Now, I want to again thank my guest for coming on this evening. Uh, I thought it was very enjoyable. I hope you did as well, and we can do this again. Uh, and, and thanks to each and all of you for watching and chatting. Uh, if you made a super chat donation, it's truly appreciated your chat. Excuse me, your support is what makes this possible. So please like, share, and subscribe. So uh, my new book, The Meme Humanoids, Modern Myths Are Real Monsters, is now available at, at Amazon.com. And we talked a bit about it tonight. So next week, we'll have Chad Lewis joining us. And as you may know, Chad is one of the foremost paranormal and 14 researchers among us has written dozens of books uh, about most aspects of the unknown, the unexplained. Uh, it should be a great conversation. So until next week, stay healthy and have a safe and enjoyable weekend. Good night.